On economic and monetary union, I stress that we will be ready to move beyond the present position to the creation of a European monetary fund and a common community currency, which we have called a hard ECU. But we would not be prepared to agree to set a date for starting the next stage of economic and monetary union before there is any agreement on what that stage should comprise. And I again emphasize that we would not be prepared to have a single currency imposed upon us, nor to surrender the use of the pound sterling as our currency. It is our purpose to retain the power and influence of this House and not to denude it of many of the powers. I wonder what the Right Honourable Gentleman's policy is in view of some of the things he said. Would he have agreed to a commitment to extend the community's powers to other supplementary sectors of economic integration without having any definition of what they are? Would he? Because you would have thought he would from what he said. One of them was that the Commission wants to extend, extend its powers and competence into the area of health. We said, no, we weren't going to agree to those things. And what he says, he sounded as if he would, for the sake of agreeing, for the sake of being little Sir Echo and saying me too. <laughs> would he have agreed to extending qualified majority voting within the Council, to delegating implementing powers to the Commission, to a common security policy, all without any attempt to divine or limit them? The answer is yes, he hasn't got a clue about the definition of some of the things he is saying, let alone securing a definition of others. Yes, the Commission does want to increase its powers. Yes, it is a non-elected body, and I do not want the Commission to increase its powers against this House. So, of course, we are differing. Of course, the Chairman or the President of the Commission, Mr. Delors, said at press conference the other day that he wanted the European Parliament to be the democratic body of the community. He wanted the Commission to be the executive, and he wanted the Council of Ministers to be the Senate. No. No, no. Oh, 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 oh. Perhaps the Labour Party would give all those things up easily. Perhaps they would agree to a single currency, to total abolition of the pound sterling. Perhaps being totally incompetent with monetary matters, they'd be only too delighted to hand over the full responsibility as they did to the IMF, to a central bank. The fact is, they have no competence on money, no competence on the economy, so yes, the Right Honourable Gentleman would be glad to hand it all over. But what is the point in trying to get elected to Parliament only to hand over your sterling and to hand over the powers of this House to Europe? Before the commit. Friend, not agree that the mark of a single currency is that all other currencies must be extinguished, and not merely extinguished, but that the capacity of other institutions to issue currency has to be extinguished. And that, in the case of the United Kingdom, would involve this Parliament binding its successors in a way which we have hitherto regarded as unconstitutional. This government has no intention of abolishing the pound sterling. If the hard echo evolved into much, much greater use, that would be a decision for future parliaments and future generations. It would be a decision which could only be taken once and a decision which should not be approached in this atmosphere, but only after the greatest possible consideration. I believe both Parliament and Stirling have served our country and the rest of the world very well. I believe we are more stable and more influential with it. I believe it is an expression of sovereignty. This government believes in the pound sterling. Dr. David Owen. Is it not perfectly clear that what was being attempted at Rome was a bounce, and a bounce that led only one way, and that was to a single federal United States of Europe. And is it not vital that in this House, across party lines, it is possible for a Prime Minister to go and make it clear, if necessary, that Britain is prepared to stand alone? We don't relish it, but that if necessary, 
if we are faced by the imposition by treaty of an obligation to a single currency and a, and a situation which would prevent the enlargement to Poland, Hungary and Czechoslovakia, Britain would be entitled and right to use the veto. I totally agree with the right honourable gentleman. That was precisely the stance we took. It is a stance we have taken on many previous occasions. The European monetary system, the European monetary system to which we belong, is a system designed for 12 sovereign states in cooperation with one another to come to a European, to come to the exchange rate mechanism. What they are proposing now, an economic and monetary union, is really the back door to a federal Europe, and we totally and utterly reject that. We would have greater economic and monetary cooperation, which can be achieved by keeping our sovereignty. There is no majority in this House for EMU, but is the Prime Minister aware that I attended a conference in Italy last year, and an Italian minister spoke to me about EMU, and I said, what if Mrs. Thatcher opposes it? And Uncle Antley, he laughed out loud, and he said, oh, we've met Mrs. Thatcher many times. She squawks and makes a noise at the beginning, but always comes round and gives way in the end. Now, what assurances and guarantees can she give this House today that she will not give way on this issue as she did give way on the Madrid condition about British inflation before she joined the ERM? That's what they said, Mr. Speaker, when I was negotiating for a better budget deal for Britain. Twice they and the people in the Commission and our people in the Commission and we had the presidency of the Commission advised me to give way. They found out different. Mr. Speaker, next Wednesday the doors of this chamber will be closed to Black Rod as a symbol of the independence of this House. What will be the effect on the independence of this House and the nation which elects it if the power to veto proposals affecting social affairs, environment and taxation were to be removed? Mr Speaker, I hope that when the next election comes, people who want to come to this House will come to uphold its powers and its responsibilities and not to denude this House of them. We have surrendered some of them to the community. In my view, we have surrendered enough. Mr. Ben! Is the Prime Minister aware that what we're really discussing is not a matter of economic management, but the whole future of the relations between this country and Europe? Are the British people, when they vote in a general election, to be able to change the policies of the government that has previously been there? And it is already a fact as the House knows full well that whatever government is in power, our agricultural policy is now controlled from Brussels, our trade policy is controlled from Brussels, our industrial policy is controlled from Brussels, and if we go into the EMU, our financial policy will become... It is a democratic and not a nationalistic argument. But may I also say this to the Prime Minister, having been a member of the government that took us in, to the EC without consulting the British people. Yeah. Having been a, a Prime Minister of a government that agreed to the Single European Act without consulting the British people, yeah. having now agreed to the ERM without consulting the British people, well, we do not really find it uh, hard to believe, we find it hard to believe that she is really intent on preserving democracy rather than gaining some political advantage from waiving uh, some national argument in the eve of a general election. That is why we do not trust her own judgment on the matter. Mr. Speaker, I think I would put it just a little bit differently from the right honourable gentleman, although I recognise some of the force of some of the points it is making. I think when the proposals for, the law proposals for EMU came out, the Economic and Monetary Union, it was said immediately by my right honourable friend, the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, that this was not really about monetary policy at all. It was really about a backdoor to a federal Europe. A federal Europe taking many, many democratic powers away from democratically elected bodies to non elected bodies. I believe fervently that that is true which is why I will have nothing to do with their definition of economic and monetary union.